Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Berta Urins, a PhD research assistant at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So Berta, before we get started, would you mind sharing with the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, first of all, thank you all for having me. I'm, as you said, I'm a PhD student. Currently, I'm doing my studies in Canada, but I'm originally from Spain. I studied um, my bachelor in uh, agricultural engineering, and then I did my master's as, uh, in Spain as well uh, in animal nutrition. And now I'm studying animals, I'm studying animal sciences in, in University Laval in Canada. And my research is mainly focused on precision feeding and how to improve the environmental impact of precision feeding. So when talking about the environmental impact of pig production, there's a very important thing that it's to, to know which part of the process contributes the most to the overall environmental impact in each category. And in climate change, CO2 emissions, this main contributor is feed production. So how our feed ingredients are produced, where our feed ingredients are produced, and uh, which feed ingredients we choose. Are, are responsible for between 60 and 80 percent of uh, the CO2 emissions of the whole chain. Um, therefore, this is, is the main focus area in, in CO2 emissions. When we, talk, when we speak about acidification or, or eutrophication, which are emissions of other composts, then um, the animal excretions are the ones that have uh, that that impact the most um, the the environment those environmental categories. So, uh, if you have a, a feeding technique that reduces uh, animal excretion, so nitrogen and phosphorus excretion, you can have benefit. But in climate change, the benefits are not going to be uh, as big as it would as they would be if you just change feed ingredients or use fit ingredients with less environmental impact. Gotcha. So like you said, I see that you've done some work on persistent feeding strategies and seeing how they impact the environment. Could you share with us a little bit about uh, what it, you've been studying and what exactly you learned? Yes. Um, first of all, I want to explain a little bit about individual precision feeding, which is the, the main area that I'm working on. This is when we provide each and each day uh, a blend of two feeds that, provi- that provide them the amount of protein that, that covers the, their nutritional requirements. So with that, we are already saving uh, 30 per- or having a 30% less of emissions than that if we compare it to a three-phase uh, feeding prob- program. And what I did in, in my previous research is doing a life cycle assessment of that. So I compared from, from how we grow our crops here in, in Quebec, Canada, which is a special area because it produces the soybean, the corn, and the wheat, which are the main the three main ingredients of our feed. And then I, I also took into the consideration the nursery phase and the, um, the farrowing phase. Uh, and their emissions, but those were equal for both for both treatments. So precision feeding and conventional feeding, they had the same nursery phase and, and farrowing phase. So up until then, they had the same environmental impact. But then uh, once we added the, the emissions from the barn and the, the, the impact of, of making the different diets and the emissions of the, the manure management, we, we found that um, individual precision feeding uh, improved the, the environmental impact of, of the whole system by 5% in climate change emissions, so in CO2 emissions, uh, 18% in acidification, and 16% in, in, in eutrophication. So with... With that, uh, what what we have, the picture that we have in, in Quebec, in, in Canada, it's very differ- different than the picture that we would have in Europe, where I'm from, because here, as I said, the soybean, the soybean is, is of national origin, so there's a very small um, transport impact related to that. Meanwhile, in, in Spain, for example, they bring most of the soybean or soybean meal from South America, 
So there's a huge um, environmental impact related to that transport. And then depending on which areas of South America the, um, the soybean is, is cultivated, uh, it, uh, they also have a uh, deforestation impact related to it. So uh, while in Europe, the main problem is protein. So then my, my guess is, or my hypothesis is that a precision fed uh, pig would have way less uh, environmental impact in climate change, way, way less CO2 emissions uh, when compared to a conventional um, pig in, in, in Europe. Here in Canada, because the soybean is from uh, national origin and it's not our main problem ingredient, the CO2 gain is, is quite small compared with the other impact categories that I studied. But um, um, when you look at the benefits of having a precision fed peak uh, when, uh, on the other impact categories like acidification or, not, or eutrophication, there you have a, a real benefit to, to that. And also one of the very, well, the thing that it surprised us the most when we did this research was the fact that corn was our main prob problem, problem ingredient here in, in Canada. Uh, so that's why precision feeding improved in, in climate change, but didn't improve a lot because our, our feeds are mainly uh, based off of corn. We, corn is the main ingredient in our feeds. So now what I'm going to do during my, my next years of, the, of my PhD is trying to find alternative feed ingredients to reduce uh, the, the, the climate change impact of precision fed pigs and which alternative ingredients can be good to include in, in our feeding systems to, to improve even more the, the environmental benefits of, of those. That's a little bit uh, what I've did so far and a little bit of what I'm going to do next but the the main thing is that um it's very important the context where you are studying so in canada as i said all the all the crops or most of the crops are from national origin and that's a very different landscape that it could be in another country okay so basically what you're saying is that the more transport that is required to deliver the ingredients the higher the margin is to reduce the CO2 emissions because you're able to save more on the soybean meal and not waste as much. Is that kind of the thought process there? Yes, um, because in, in individual precision feeding, what we do is, is reduce a lot the amount of uh, protein in ingestion and also protein excretion through that. Um, if you have a, a product that is produced very close to it with low uh, emission related to the production, to, to the crop and also to the transport, you are you are gaining, yes, but you are not gaining that much when you go yeah, that that you would if you compare it to another scenario where the the protein uh, it's produced very far away and it has a, a more CO two emission related to, to that transport. Gotcha. So basically, from, from what you said earlier on, you said that this was based on a typical three-phase finisher budget. Um, but I know depending on where you are, um, it can vary the amount of uh, phases that you have in the finisher. For instance, in the U.S., we typically have four to five phases. Um, so do you plan to do any more research on this in terms of maybe increasing uh, the amount of phases that are available and then see um, how that also impacts the emissions? Uh, yes, the, the new uh, research that I'm going to do with the alternative feed ingredients, we, when we will compare to a conventional system, our conventional system will probably have four phases. Another thing that I, I want to say is that all the, the data related to precision feeding versus conventional feeding came from um, all the research that we did in, in our lab. And that in this research, we saw that there was no difference on meat quality and, and growing rate in, in both groups. So even though precision feeding is more uh, nutrient efficient, it's not more feed efficient. The, the pigs still eat the same amount of feed, but because that feed is more diluted or by the end of the growth phase is more diluted or it's uh, catered to every pig, we are using less nutrients to grow the, the, 
animals. A leader in swine nutrition solutions driven by science. Novus's products and services look at the whole animal, focusing on productivity and well-being, in order to feed the world affordable and wholesome food. For more information, visit Novus's website at www.novusint.com. When it comes to raising healthy animals, you need more than the right solutions. You need the right partner who brings decades of industry expertise and a global team to put that knowledge to work for the advancement of your operation. At Fibro Animal Health Corporation, we are proud to work with you as your trusted partner. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing all this data with us. Thank you for inviting me. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Hey.